Hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, participating to this uh, workshop. Uh, I am Pancrazio, uh, as Vera said. Thank you, Vera. And uh, today we are going to talk about pitching your ideas or your stage or your uh, fundraising uh, request uh, to multiple uh, people, VC investors, but as you will see, uh, many more uh, people, different people. So we can jump directly into the presentation. I have some slides that will help us to follow a logical sequence, but feel free to use the Zoom Q&A tool to ask questions that I will see uh, in the in a side panel. And then at some point, uh, I will look at the questions and, and answer in real time. And uh, um, there is also the chat. So if you have any problems during the webinar, audio, audio problems or, or other um, viewing the, the slides, uh, just uh, write into the chat and uh, uh, and there is a team that is monitoring it. So it will, it will uh, try to solve the problems. Okay, thank you. Let's start. So share the screen. Desktop one. And let's start with the slide. So as you see, the the topic, uh, the subtopic of the of the slide deck is how to get that second meeting. The idea is that uh, we want to make sure that you understand that uh, when you pitch, that's only the beginning of a relationship. And so you have always to have clear in mind what is the goal of the pitch you are making in that very specific moment. Okay, you may do you may. Uh, give the same pitch multiple times, but every time uh, there is a, a different goal for that pitch. Sometimes, uh, usually the first time you, you, you make the pitch, the goal is to get a second meeting. And the reason is, is very simple. Uh, it's, it's because why, why do we pitch? Uh, we want to start building our credibility. And usually we have a, a very short time to do it, okay? So uh, you are gonna make the pitch, the same pitch over and over again, but every time you are making progress, you are advancing in the stage with the same person or the same team of persons, or maybe the, the team of persons is, increasing, is, is becoming larger with new people coming in, and so you have to make the pitch again. So it's always building your credibility. And every time it's very important that you tune in in a mindset where it's not you that are trying to transfer the information or what you are building or the idea you are, you are giving, but always try always to balance the thing, to balance your passion for giving information and for sharing what you are doing and why with the fact that they have to find something for them. So it's very important that before starting your pitching, you maybe ask some questions to understand more about the person you have in front of you, okay? Or do research before the meeting. It depends if it is a, an impromptu meeting that you are at a networking in a networking event. And so you ask questions about your, the person in front of you and then you give the pitch or you make research before giving the pitch. So always keep in mind to understand what, what's in it for them in your pitch, okay? So they can find value for them. If it is a, an, inter, an introduction that you are looking for, you have to show that you have something relevant and you are credible because the person in front of you will not spend their reputation for you if they don't believe that you are worth it. And the third, mo the third reason for making a pitch is because the time is limited and you can only pitch key elements of your idea, of your venture, you want to create a desire to know more. And so when you, you will see, when you show something about your idea, uh, about the various aspects of your idea, you want to create desire to know more in the people you are pitching, okay? So always share the more interesting part of your idea in a way that makes clear that there is more to say and it's gonna be fun and it's gonna be interesting. And so it's important that you touch all the bases. This is another important thing that we will see today is you touch all the aspects in the single pitch, but in a way 
that will make them desire for more about that. And so they, and so you are going to gain your second meeting about that. So now the, the key thing becomes, okay, pitching to whom? Because we said that each person, each different role has different goals, different jobs to be done. And so you have to understand, first of all, who you have in front of you. Some examples, you can have an angel investor in front of you. You can have a VC associate that is scouting the market of startups uh, to create a list and to verify that you are fit for meeting a VC partner that instead is looking for investment opportunities and wants to become your advocate and shepherd you through the process of the VC funding. Or you may want to hire a talented person. And so you are pitching them practically the same thing, but from an angle of making them desire to join you in this venture. And so again, you are pitching them the idea you have and the reason why you are making it and the opportunity that there is for them. So they join you. Or you may pitch to an advisor that you want is a person, maybe a busy, a busy person, but with a very strong network or very strong expertise, very strong knowledge of a domain or a market. And so you want, you want them as your advisor. And so in order for them to make space in their schedule for you as a founder, you want to pitch them your idea. So they uh, want to be part of your venture. You may even want to pitch to your parents. Uh, the typical thing is uh, make your mom or your dad uh, understand what you do and why you're doing. They, they want to, they are like investors. They are interested in return and risk. They want you to have a happy life, okay? To have return on their investment. And they also want you to de-risk your choices in life. And so they want to know that what you are doing is your passion, it's something you love, it's something that you are finding realization in it. And also they want to know that you are doing it in a smart way, okay? And not running big risks that are beyond uh, reasonable. And the proverbial random person in an elevator. So you will have many opportunities that you think to give the elevator pitch. So let's start from that. So an elevator pitch is the fact that you are, imagine you are in San Francisco and you are going into the Salesforce Tower, which is the tallest building in the city. The Salesforce Tower has like 61 feet floors and, uh, and the elevator takes less than a minute to, to go there. And so suppose that you are going to a meetup and the meetup is happening on that floor and you have in front of you the person that is the perfect person to understand what you do and you want to really make sure that in that time you have they decide to follow up with you okay they decide to maintain the channel open and so you start saying that our company makes our solution for our target segment. And we help our users solve this problem with these benefits over the existing alternatives, over the existing solutions. We are initially targeting our first market segment. We make our money by our business model. We acquire customers by our acquisition strategy. And our lifetime value is a multiple of our cost of acquisition. We have our team advantage and our technology advantage, and we already have our traction statement. Now we are seeking funding to achieve our primary objective. And this is less than 56 seconds, which is the time to get to the 61st floor of the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco. As you can see, in the capital, in capital letters, you already have most of the plugins 
of all the slides that you're gonna prepare, all the parts of the pitch. We are going today through uh, some uh, tips, some examples, and at the end, I will also give you a couple of checklists that you can use to make sure that whatever is the format, whatever the sequence of the slide you will decide to use, uh, you are going to have a checklist in the form of questions that will simply ask, are you answering this question in your slide deck? So the, the elevator pitch is something that you can screenshot, or you will get also the slides after this webinar, and you will rewrite this thing with your own content. So the first homework that I would like to give you is to write down the elevator pitch by replacing the placeholders I put with your things. And because it's an elevator pitch, you really have to make your challenges to really be very dry and very clear and very concise so that you can stay within a minute. Okay. And by the way, uh, for the startups in San Francisco that will come to San Francisco, Sandy Miller will ask you your very first day to give a one minute pitch in, in front of all the audience. So the very first day when you arrive, so you are jet lagged, you are confused by this new environment and Sandy will ask you to give the one minute pitch. So uh, use this template and prepare for this. So now let's jump into another context, uh, the venture capital context. I want to give you a preview of what will happen if you are successful with your first meeting, okay? So you may be asking, how many meetings are you gonna go through? Who are the attendees to each of these meetings? And what content gets discussed in each of these meetings, okay, to different audiences. So these are very important. So this is a very rare view because nobody talks, uh, unless you know other founders that successfully secured funding, uh, this is an information that is very rare to find in normal literature or in normal um, narrative. So it's very important uh, that you understand how many meetings to uh, understand how important is your investment in creating a very good pitch, okay? Because you are gonna use it many times. So let's see quickly. The first meeting, of course, is optional, but it's very common. It's a screening meeting. Usually is is done on a video call and it's done with an associate. It's very rare that a partner, uh, unless the fund is, is a small one, but usually in a medium-sized fund, you will have an associate do the screening for the partner. And essentially uh, on the right side in the content, you will see the founder part and the VC part. So in a screening meeting, you are gonna do a high level pitch, which is a condensed version of the pitch, mostly focusing, uh, mostly focusing on the problem you solve and the, and the key high level of the solution and your uh, market projections and your revenue projection um, and also your stage and the VC will check if you are a fit for their pipeline, their deal flow and also for the investment thesis because when they uh, uh, raise the funds for the fund um, they shared an investment thesis with the limited partners that put the money in the fund and so the very important thing in this stage is that what you do, the area you are, and the type of technology you deal with uh, aligns with the investment thesis of the VC. So sometimes a rejection at this level doesn't mean that you are not a good startup. Sometimes it means that you don't fit their investment thesis. The first meeting in person usually is done with a partner. Uh, which is a person that uh, <clears throat> is responsible for finding opportunities <coughs> to invest and groom them. So you are going to do your full initial pitch, okay, typically 10 minutes, um, and the VC is gauging interest. So it's 
it's essentially, as you will see later, we'll see a broader sense of fit across multiple dimensions. We will see in a minute. Then there is a second meeting where the original partner is taking in another partner to have another pair of eyes, to have a second opinion about his initial or her initial intuition. And they're gonna ask more questions. And this is good because you're gonna do the same pitch. And doing the same pitch means that whatever that they are being exposed, especially the original partner to the same pitch a second time. And so they are going to understand more about your idea. Then if you pass the second meeting and the second partner says, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think it's, it's good to expose these guys to the larger team. You are going through multiple so-called diligence meetings where uh, experts, colleagues of the partner, uh, and some uh, uh, references, maybe some, uh, some other founders uh, in the same space, um, they are going to ask you questions. And so at that point, you will become reactive and they may ask questions about the technology, about the business model, about the financial projections, about your go-to market, about your, the incentives for um, new customers to abandon the original solution and to, to try your solution, they will ask many questions based on their background. And this may be a set of multiple meetings. Then uh, when the diligence meetings with specific people give green light, uh, then you will go in front of the investment team. That is a set of people that usually will then gather and decide um, if they have uh, multiple startups in the same field, you are gonna compete with them and they will decide which one uh, they will fund. And again, you will go with the initial pitch and the VC will look harder to uncover gaps in your pitch, in your idea, in your go-to-market, in your business model and so on and so forth. Then if the, group, if the investment team says green light, then you will meet one-to-one -one, um, uh, you, sorry, we will meet uh, with the partnership. That means all the partners that have to green light uh, the final word for the investment. And you will also have the original partner, not as a judge anymore, but as your advocate. So he or she will actually try to sell you to, uh, to his partners. Then at the final meeting, you will meet one-to-one -one with the original partner. The original partner will share the term sheet that means how they want to invest in you, how much money or how much equity, what are all the clauses that you have to read very carefully or, or compare with the, confront with, them, with the lawyer and also try to sell their investment firm to you because they assume that you are shopping around and you have discussions with more than one VC. Okay, and especially if the idea is very interesting. And so they try to compete now with other VCs in order to be the lead investor in your startup. So this is the way that is, it works. And this happened to me uh, a few times, uh, including times where it failed, but we uh, arrived uh, into diligence meetings or group meetings, or even at the term sheet, and then we rejected the term sheet. So. This is more or less what happens in the 80% of the cases. There are some VCs that may be, that may be faster. They have been very fast in the past. Now things are uh, slowed down. So very likely you will have the full set of meetings, but this is more or less the blueprint of what happens. Okay. Some tips about the original partner. So the original partner that is really trying to uh, help you get funded, um, wants to become your advocate. So you have to share with them uh, the information that start building trust, okay? That's very important because that partner initially is a judge that decides whether you are worth it or not, but then he or she becomes your advocate that will help you, share, that will help you go through the process, okay? It's very important for them. And so it's very important, and they will ask you that, why 
you are putting energy on this venture, why you started the company. It's very important, especially in early stage, where there is no much evidence of your, of your business. It's very important that you share why you started the company, why you onboarded your co-founders, why you onboarded your first employees, why you are doing what you're doing, why you left your PhD to start the company, why you did something in your life that justifies or explains why you are embarking in this high-risk venture. So it's very important that you start sharing that aspect with them. And then the last thing, build trust with them means also sharing your gaps in one-to-one -one meeting before they are discovered in the diligence because discovering these gaps, your gaps in the diligence means exposing them again on, on their own uh, investment team. And so it's very important that you share with them the problems. For example, usual problem, a co-founder left, okay? That's a typical problem. It's very important to share with them in a one-to-one -one meeting, uh, or you had, uh, you had a, 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 a funding in the past that jeopardized the, the, the cap table. And so now your cap table is really not clean. And so you have to confront with them on how to clean the cap table or what are the patterns that they uh, want to see in the cap table. So these are usual, usual problems. Um, now let's talk about what investors look for. Before that, there is a question from Federico. Uh, he says, acquisition strategy, should it be part of the elevator pitch? Well, it depends if, if, it depends if the acquisition is uh, a standard one or is a special one. If it is a standard one, you, you just can say, uh, our acquisition strategy is, I don't know, word of mouth uh, or uh, is uh, advertising or is uh, uh, referrals. But in general, uh, it's a question that you are going to uh, you're going to receive because when you create something new and you put it in the market, nobody knows about you, okay? And, uh, and so it's important that you think about it and show that you think that you thought about it. So talking about the acquisition strategy is not sharing the details, is uh, telling, and I also thought about the acquisition strategy, okay? That's why you have to prove them that you, you thought about it. Okay, don't share the questions, don't share the details, but tell them about the acquisition strategy because if you don't mention it, um, you will be less compelling. So mention it and show that you discussed, you thought about it. So what, back to the, to the flow, what do investors look for? So they look for return and risk, of course. This is the only job that they have. They have to uh, look for return on the investment of their LPs that put the money in their fund. And they have to select teams, founders, that in some way they risk the, the, the venture, essentially. Let's see some details about it. So about return, it's very simple. Um, they have every fund has a minimum of 10 times the return. So if they invest 1 million, they have to return at least 10 millions to the fund. And be careful that each fund usually has a life of 10 years. So before talking to a VC, always ask some questions. One of these questions is, where are you with the life cycle of your fund? Because uh, if they are at the beginning of the fund, it's very good because they have to um, uh, look for deals. If they are toward the mid life of the fund, let's say four or five years, this means that they are seeking an exit within four or five years maximum. So you have to uh, shape your pitch in order to show them that you can give them an exit, a, a liquidity event uh, in three years, okay? So this is very important. And, uh, but ideally the fund aims to go 100 times, okay? So the ideal for everybody is finding a venture scale idea that shows that in 10, in 10 years, uh, there will be 100 million per year revenue, okay? So this is these are just ballparks, but to, just to let you 
understand what do they have in mind, okay? If you are designing a company that is gonna be profitable, but with a trajectory of revenue that is not like this, is not going 10X, 20X, uh, they are not interested, okay? They are not interested in good businesses. They are interested in venture scale businesses. Okay, this is a very big, very big difference. Okay, don't show good businesses. Show venture scale businesses. So it's very important. Let's talk about risk, which is maybe more interesting for making your pitch. Okay, so when they talk, when they think about risk, usually, at least all the all the VCs that I talk to, they have categories in mind. Okay, so I put some categories here. So the first uh, risk category is which stage you are you. Okay. Uh, the second is which market are you in? The, the, third, the third category is uh, what's the team? The fourth category is product. What's the product? And then execution. What's, what are the plans for execution? What are the abilities of this team to execute on specific things? And you can think that after, while you do the pitch, it's kind of they intuitively assign some score in their mind to all these categories, okay? So each VC may have different sensitivities and we will see that uh, later today. Um, but in general, these are the dominant categories uh, that when you talk to VCs, uh, when you get objections or rejections, this is, this is maybe more interesting for you. When you get a rejection, it's very important to investigate which of these categories uh, generated that rejection so that you can understand where are the weaknesses of your pitch or maybe it's not your weakness maybe it's a lack of fit between your pitch and their uh, and what they are looking for so it's important that you understand after every pitch uh, you make a post-mortem and understand which of this category you need to um, get better at so Let's dive into these five categories and let's try to understand what they are. The first one is stage. Okay, stage is very simple. Um, they will try to put you in a bucket that essentially says, okay, this, this team is pre-product. So okay, the risk level is the highest because um, the risk level means that you don't have a product yet. And so this investment is to build the first version of the product. And so there is the maximum uncertainty. Then the, lane, the next stage is pre-fit, pre-product market fit. This means that you have a first version of the product, or maybe you have some versions, some iterations of it, but you don't have proof that a group of people are willing to pay regularly for your value proposition for your product. So you are pre-product market fit, pre-PMF. Another stage is pre-scale. This means that, um, so in, in a pre-fit stage, uh, putting their money into your venture means I am financing the product market fit, means that they are going to use my money to bring the product in the hands of the, the potential customers and see if there is if there is a fit with their needs. Instead, pre-scale means that you have a product market fit. So you proved that in a small scale, you can satisfy the needs of your clients. But now you have to prove that you can scale up and means that you have to optimize the organization. You have to build the organization. You have to build your presence. For example, in geographies, it depends on the business you are. Uh, you have to make uh, agreements with hardware manufacturers everything that you need to do what you do at scale. Making at scale means that the unit economics that you have in a single sale, and we will see this later, are maintained even if you have a lot of clients. This means that all your customer support, your delivery, your production, they keep the pace without increasing the unit economics, or actually decreasing the unit economics. The more you sell, the less you should have cost for. In terms of market risks, uh, the questions they have in mind is, is this market large? 
and growing. And this is very important. Um, if you are in a growing market, that's the best way of de risking the market risk. Okay. If you are in a market that is mature and you are bringing in a solution that is an optimization, it's very rare that you're going to get an investment. So usually venture capital firms invest in, 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 on teams that are in, a, in an expanding market, okay? And bringing innovation in an expanding market. That's their idea. Uh, then they will ask questions about, okay, but what are the incentives for users, customers, partners uh, to adopt your product, to uh, connect your product, to help you doing things? So what are the incentives? Did you think about them in your business model? Because the business model is also made of incentives for new users to abandon their existing solution and adopt your solution, uh, or for partners to spend their time and invest on you because you are interesting for them. So what are the incentives for them? Um, they will ask if there are incumbents, are you in a, in a crowded market with incumbents? So big companies offering a solution that is similar to your solution. Uh, how do you make money? What is, what, are your, what is your revenue model? And how do you find prospects? What is your acquisition strategy? And how do you close deals? What is your closing strategy? For example, if you have a free product and the free product is to find paying customers, what is your strategy to convert the free users into paying users? Then product risks. Is the product useful? So does it deliver value to the, to, the, to the user? Is it usable? So is it only for tech savvy or is it also for people that uh, are not, that are newcomers into this, this type of, of, of world? Uh, and how is it good compared to other solutions? Not feature by feature, but in terms of benefits, okay? Every comparison you make doesn't have to be by feature, but by benefits. And we will see this specifically in a section in a couple of minutes. And so the, essentially they are looking for the Delta. So when you introduce your product into the market, your solution into the market, what is the Delta in benefits, the difference in benefits that is perceived by users compared to the existing solution? The team risk, they are looking for your expertise in, in the industry, in the domain you are uh, working on, uh, in making operations. Are you capable of organizing the company? Uh, um, what is your specific expertise in technology, in the core technology that is enabling your innovation? And also startup culture. Are you able to do it in a in a way that where there is no hard organization, where there are no departments to support it. Maybe you are used to work in a large corporate and you are not comfortable in a startup where you have multiple people have to wear multiple hats and there is some chaos and the communication is kind of uh, up and down. So are you, are you comfortable to really work in a startup environment? This is another risk they look for. And then finally, execution. Uh, do you have plans to scale marketing? Do you have plans to make sales repeatable? Do you have plans to support your customers in, a, in an ordered way? Do you have uh, plans for product development at scale? Okay, will you keep the pace to stay competitive over time? And so this doesn't mean that you have to do it, but they want to see the seeds that you know that you're gonna do these things, okay? And that you're gonna hire people to do these things when you're gonna have the money. So they want to see all these things in perspective, okay? The fact you don't have the money doesn't mean that you don't have to think about putting a hire, a critical hire to organize customer service if customer service is very important for your success or to organize product development in certain way and so on and so forth. So these are the five risks. The goal in the pitch is not to provide solutions to all these things, but is to show that you reduce these risks by planning, by having a mental space for these things, by mentioning them, 
Okay, and and so the fact you already just that to touch them, you mention them, will give them the idea that you are aware of that. Okay, this is one of the most common mistakes. These things get removed by from the pitch because it's not time to talk about it, and so the investor will ask the questions, and you waste precious time of the Q and A time. Okay, we will discuss this also too, but. It's important that you touch and try to de-risk all these things by mentioning things in your pitch. But remember, always remember that rejection is not failure in a pitch. Rejection is calibration. That's why it's important to understand which risk category has been perceived as weak or too high risk and adjust the pitch to address that specific thing until you have all your bars, risk bars into the green zone. Okay, this is so take note of the categories and uh, you will have a checklist at the end of this uh, workshop and you will test your pitch. And now just a quick word on VC partners. So in, in my experience, uh, all the VC partners I met uh, have very different sensitivities because they come from different backgrounds. If you have a VC partner coming from the large corporation may have certain, certain preferences for scale, uh, but uh, if they come from marketing, they may have preferences for go to market and so on. So very likely they will ask questions because they come from their background. Some examples, you may get hard questions on the value proposition to the customer. Uh, people with product background, they will be very hard in understanding why you are better. What are the dimensions where you are better? What's the value? Why a, a, a user should move away from the existing solution and come to your solution? What are the incentives for other influencers in the buying process, especially if you go B2B? In B2B, you don't have one uh, counterpart. You have a lot of people, one buyer, one decision maker, but a lot of people uh, telling their opinion to the decision maker. Another sensitivity can be in the go-to-market. Um, you may be targeted with questions uh, about uh, what is your unfair distribution advantage. For example, the fact that uh, you are in a crowded market, but you found a channel that makes you um, put you in a, in a position of advantage in, in distributing your solution. For example, as an add-on in a platform or through a big distributor into the pharmaceutical world or uh, to sell batteries to big utilities through a large brand that you have a special relationship with. So what is your unfair distribution advantages? That means that you are not on a level field, but you have an advantage compared to other competitors. Or you may find partners that have a big ability to zoom out and zoom in like crazy, okay? They ask questions about the market context, so big picture, and also zoom in and ask you about the unit economics, like uh, what is your lifetime value? What is your cost of acquisition? Uh, what are the um, uh, specific uh, details about certifications uh, in an industry? So um, you may find this kind of partners with the big zoom in and zoom out. So just uh, know that this can happen and not get uh, overwhelmed by this kind of zooming in and out. Another interesting uh, aspect uh, that may stop a relationship is if you don't help bridging the asymmetry gap in what they know about your startup, okay? And this is important to establish trust. So you have to find a way to talk about the past of your company or to talk about a gap in your team or to talk about a problem in the go-to-market in a constructive way because this will make you more trusted, okay? If you try to hide the information and they discover that information later, that's a very big negative for building the trust. So that's, that's a fine balance. And then the final thing is some partners come from the startup world, okay? They may have been 
ex-founders with big success. And so they look for uh, the culture and your priorities, okay? If they see that your priorities are your team, your employees, the customer is at the center of your thing, um, the sustainability of the business, the cash flow, these are all good aspects that this kind of partner will see in you because they will see themselves and the mistakes that they did in the past and they see that you are aware of those things and you are really taking care of that. That is one of, part of the success of accelerators like Y Combinator, because Y Combinator has a set of mentors that are very strong in this culture, okay, in the startup culture. And so they take very uh, young founders and they help them not to make those mistakes in hiring, in putting, in not accepting special uh, contracts from large companies or develop custom features. They try to avoid those big mistakes. Just because a, a big company is paying you for a proof of concept doesn't mean that you have to do it, okay? You have to think, what is this proof of concept bringing me, okay? So these are mistakes that are typically uh, made by people with no advice. And so if they see that your priority is always the product roadmap, the priority is to uh, customer feedback, to know why customers are not using your product or they are getting stuck in the pipe, in the, in the, in the funnel, or they are happy with your product. If you keep the customer at the center, if you keep the employees at the center, if you um, keep technology at the center of the things, instead of uh, just thinking about revenue and cash and so on, this is another positive thing. And we can discuss this later. So um, do you have any, any questions? Because we covered a lot already, okay. So we can go on with some tips. Okay. One of the typical questions I get at this point is, wait, we are early stage startup. We don't have most of what you talked about. And that's normal. Um, so we have uh, a, a question in the, in the system that, uh, Elisabetta, you may, may start the first question about the stage and, and see if you, if you can answer a question that will pop up on your screen. <laughs> So this question is about understanding your stage. Where are you in the timeline that we discussed? Are you pre-MVP? Are you pre-fit? Are you pre-scale? Then there is another question that is about if you if you already pitched to investors. And uh, if you have a pitch deck, of course, or if you have been already funded, or if you're just uh, bootstrapping with your own money or as a side project uh, or money. So friends and family means uh, people that did not do a due diligence. So not professional investors. They gave you the money but uh, really not looking into what you're doing, but just superficially. Instead, VC is, is VC, and non-VC funding can be uh, a loan from the bank uh, or other forms of financing. In the, instead, question five is about your future, what you are looking for. Are you looking for covering your funding from a single VC or lead VC follow-on? multiple checks, crowdfunding is another interesting option, uh, getting a bank loan, or you don't have a plan yet because you are evaluating. Good, we are already halfway with the participants. Federico, thank you for the question. We will talk specifically about traction in, in 10 minutes. So um, 
you will see the the KPIs and um, it's very important. Traction is very very important. Maybe is the mo if you have traction, it's the most important thing you can say early in your pitch in order to hook up their attention. Okay, we are 60% for the questions, for the answers. I would say when we get to 70%, we can stop the poll. Enrico, thank you for the question. Well, I am not going to cover this because choosing a funding, uh, this is about pitching, but choosing a, a funding uh, avenue is, is really, should cover an entire workshop. Um, we, we can have a conversation one-to-one -one if you want after this, but um, I can say that um, uh, VCs, angels, crowdfunding. So angels, it depends on your stage and it depends on your readiness. Uh, angels are slower, but it's easier to find an angel that understands you and likes you. And so, but it's a very slow process because angels have a very slow process. Uh, VCs, go for VCs if you have a very explosive business and you can show a very strong growth, okay? So with VCs, you need you have some requirements. And so if you don't have the requirements, it's a waste of time. So angels, if you have, want a softer approach, but it's a longer, longer term and less money. VCs, if you want uh, more money, but you have really strong arguments in terms of growth, product market fit, or if you have a, a very good fit in an industry. For example, if you are into energy, then VCs for energy are, are very, very specific. And so it's easier to go for VCs. Crowdfunding is, is complex, it's expensive. Uh, and crowdfunding works only if you, only if you already have uh, most of the funding uh, soft committed. So um, for example, a company, Nuvolaris, uh, recently that I helped, uh, did a crowdfunding, but Michele, the founder, spent months before that in collecting one by one the supporters. So when he was sure that there was a very large supporting fan base, then he started crowdfunding. So crowdfunding can be done only if you already know that you have at least a 70, 60, 70% 70 of the funding already soft committed. And then you do the crowdfunding as a as a mechanism to do it in an easy way. Uh, crowdfunding is not a way to raise funding, to find found funders. It's a way to close a funding, okay? Crowdfunding is a close. Um, so VCs, if you have strong requirements, if you, if you are meeting strong requirements in growth and, and market size, and you have a strong team. Uh, angels, if you are looking for a softer way to close the funding. Crowdfunding is a mechanism to collect all the funding that you already have soft committed. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we are there. We can end the poll. Now I know more about you. <clears throat> Interesting that we have, uh, we have uh, many people, many companies that are pre-scale. This means that they have traction, which is very encouraging. And 34%, uh, they already have a product. Very cool. That's my favorite stage, of course, because it's as a product person, I really am very excited in, in working on the product market fit. Uh, Pre-MVP is the inventor's phase. That's, that's the most intriguing. Uh, did you pitch to investor already? Good. So you have, you have experience, most of you. Do you have a pitch deck? 
Yes, and you already iterated on it. Very good, 83%. Um, 80% already got funding and a good percentage um, is getting from non-VC, very interesting. Uh, what kind of fundraising are looking for? Okay, good. And do you have financial projections? Most of you have financial projects, excellent, fantastic. Okay. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions. Okay, let's go here now. So the first tip is if you are early stage and you don't have evidence of anything else, use what you have. So use the why. Communicate why you started this company. Tell a story. Start telling a story. The video that is linked at the beginning of this presentation starts with a founder story, okay? Uh, and so explain why you started, you, you had the idea initially, and then one day you decided that from idea, you would like to see if this idea works, okay? How you decided to really put your passion, energy, money, time, and so on, on this thing. Also explain, if you have it, your domain knowledge. If you spend years, spent years in this domain and you matured the understanding of the problem, of the pain by staying in the domain, tell them it's very important. If you are rooted in the domain you are of the problem, that's, that's, a, perfect, uh, that's a perfect asset you have. And also your abilities. If you are a good coder, if you are good at uh, artificial intelligence, if you are an inventor, uh, share your abilities because in Y Combinator, many people end up doing different things from the original idea just because they were mavericks at coding, for example, or at doing hardware design. Another pitch is you, you will see in every template you download from the internet, the, the very first section is about the problem. And this is very important for a reason. Investors may know something about domains, but it's not a given. So it's very important that you give, handhold them, explain them why this pain exists, how this pain is measured, okay, in the economics and so on. So it's very important that you spend more time on the problem than on your solution in the first pitch. It's very important. And that's because the investors want to see your understanding of the demand side. Instead, we are builders, we build things, right? And so we want to talk about what we supply, what we built, what we sell. And so this is a big bias that you have to be aware of. So the first thing to check in your pitch deck today is the proportion of how, how much time you spend talking about the problem, introducing them into the problem and showing them what will fuel the demand versus how much time you spend talking about the details of your solution, your product, your technology, okay? You will talk about this, about the solution. So it's demand side over supply side mentality. Demand side always wins, always in looking for allies. In this case, you are looking for capital. You have to spend more time in explaining why there will be demand for your solution. So remember the list we talked about, about the very different people here, right? They are all, they all want to know why there is going to be demand for your solution, why there is need for you, why the world will benefit of your company, okay? Show that you know the pain and that you offer strong benefits compared to other options available to these people. And you know the headwinds, you know what is going to be against your, your venture because the product will not sell by itself, okay? That's very important. One thing that they will want to know is that you know that the product will not sell by itself. Even if it is the best ever, in the initial stage, it will not sell by itself. When you are established, the word of mouth will likely be your main fuel, but initially, people will need more about that. 
So don't use too much time to explain the solution. Leave that to the Q&A and to a second meeting. Q&A is the most precious time you will have. So 10 minutes with your pitch deck and then the rest of the time Q&A. That's why the pitch deck must cover the standard questions. You don't want to get standard questions in the Q&A. You want to have special questions in the Q&A, okay? But of course, in the solution, highlight your core technology, your secret sauce. You remember that they want to invest in technology, okay? So tell them they are going to invest in tech. So let's take a quick look at the demand side. What do I mean by demand side mentality? This may not be evident. So let's spend three minutes on this. Think about this. When you think about a market, you have some people that are doing their job, okay? And they're doing their job with a set of solutions that they are using in their, com in their, in their current behavior, in their current status quo. But you notice that the current behavior and the current solutions, they generate some discomfort, some pain. They are not optimal for the job they are trying to do. And so there is a, a natural push away, something that is pushing this person away from the current solution, okay? There is this discomfort. There is a problem to solve. They want a better solution. They want to save time. They want things to cost less. They want to drive less. There is something, some metric that is representing that discomfort. Now, we want them, you want them to go to a new behavior that includes your new solution, okay? Your innovation. And so, when this person sees the new solution, there is a natural attraction. It can be curiosity. It can be uh, hope that their life will go better, get better. And so there is a pool. Think about this as a force that pulls this person to the new solution, okay? So now you have two, two forces that are helping you. There is a push force that is pushing the person away from the existing solution and your innovation that is pulling this person to your solution, okay? With a chance to get a new behavior and they become your customers. But there are other two forces. There is the anxiety of the new that you have to understand, okay? So every time a person has uncertainty around the new choice, they will have less pull to the new solution because they may be worried that abandoning the old, the old one, the status quo, they may go in trouble. And there is another force that is against you. It's the force of habit, okay? The fact that that person is used to, is incorporated that the status quo solution in their routine will also play against your success, okay? You have to be aware and map all these four forces and, and then show the investors that you know about these four things, okay? Because if you don't, they will ask the questions. They will ask uh, uh, how, how, how your new solution is so good, how is it so good that will overcome the anxiety of the new things? How is it so good that people that invested years in the existing solution will migrate into your new solution. As a product manager, I have my answers to this, my systemic answers. For example, um, for the new solution are features of automation or, or lower cost or saving time or reducing the number of people for manual work and so on. These are all the features you may think about. They typically uh, attract people the usability, a better user interface, um, uh, a, a lighter, uh, something that is lighter, so it's, it's less weight. Uh, for the anxiety of the new and the habit, for example, for the anxiety of the new, you may create a, a trial, a try and buy. So you are not gonna spend money, so you are not gonna risk money. 
But sometimes money is not the problem. Sometimes it's time. And so how do you make sure that they will not uh, stop exploring your solution because they don't have time? Maybe you create a, a connector, an import, a migration tool, uh, or you do professional services to configure your new system to match the configurations or to match the process they're using. So anxiety of the new can be reduced with professional services or with uh, a very good uh, designed onboarding UI uh, or importing data. Think about uh, a connector for Salesforce. No? Um, and then the habit. Uh, habit means that they have to do the things in their current environment. A very stupid example for this is single sign-on. The fact that they log in into their ERP software um, and they have to create a new login for your product, that's a problem that will be impacted by the habit force. Instead, if you do a single sign-on and so with the same login they do on Salesforce or on Windows, they seamlessly access your product, then you are reducing the red force of habit. Okay, so for each of the forces, if you show how your value proposition, your design, your roadmap, your plan map to these four forces, you will show the investor that you know how to think demand side. And this, is, and this will put you in a very different league of startups. For the situation, you may want to increase this force by telling people that they have a problem, that by giving them a metric to compare their optimal situation with the existing solution, so that when they see your solution, they will already know which metric to use to evaluate it. We will talk about this later when we talk about the timeline. So this is what you want to do. You want to increase the push and pull and decrease the anxiety of the new and the habit force. So these are the four forces of progress at play, and you are supposed to understand them, analyze your, the market, and analyze how your solution fits into the market demand from the perspective of your users. Now we can talk about the solution. As we said, you are a builder and you want to talk about the solution. My advice, based on all the mistakes I made in the past with many pitches, and also the gain that I saw into startups that improved their pitch deck by, by reviewing the solution part, uh, my recommendation is do it, talk about the solution, but just a little, okay? Because remember, this is the first pitch. Your goal is to have a second meeting, okay? And so you have to create a desire to know more but you want to show that you are in a very strong position. So um, highlight the benefits compared to the status quo and alternative options. So the first thing is highlight the benefits in a quantitative way, and then highlight your core innovation. So why your solution is different in the way it is implemented, okay? So the first one is why your solution is, is different for the benefits perceived by the customer. The second thing to say is why you are different because at the core of your innovation, there is some technology, some expertise, something special, some patented uh, uh, process, something that is special to you and exclusive to you that makes you more competitive, okay? Or that makes that, those benefits possible. So remember, one is highlight the benefits from the perspective of the user and highlight the core technology, the enablers that make you special. And be quantitative. Do not use absolute units if they are specialistics. I've seen a lot of pitch decks that mention kilowatt, kilowatt hour per kilogram. An investor doesn't understand that number, okay? Instead, use multipliers like 10x, 10 times better, or twice the energy density than existing solutions uh, or percentages is 50% less expensive or whatever. So you must make sure that investors appreciate the impact of your innovation on your target customers 
without being a specialist in your field. This is your responsibility. They want metrics they can understand. So be quantitative and benchmarkable. Benchmarkable means that the number you show are not in a vacuum, but are always compared to a reference point that usually is the status quo, is the existing solution, what they have today in the market before you exist, okay? So benchmarkable, always. Never put numbers that are there floating in the vacuum. An example, when they discuss, the, they explore the benefits of battery, they do batteries, okay? They say 96% more recyclable than lithium ion batteries or twice the energy in the same battery space. This means that in a container, in a truck that you put into a power plant, you will have twice the energy. Twice the energy means twice the hours of autonomy. Okay, and then 0% probability of explosion or fire. Uh, instead of putting uh, the other units like uh, hour, mean, mean time between failure and other things, uh, use relative numbers, okay? Many of you will be number people. So use this constraint. Always show numbers, benefit numbers, quantitative, but also relative to some reference point so that they, they understand dollars, they understand multipliers, they understand percentages, they understand the comparisons, okay? Fractions, always. One thing that's happened in many workshops in the past is that the most common, uh, especially in the SaaS market, the most common thing was my solution saves time. Okay, now the problem is that my solution saves time sounds intuitive, but when you go to enterprises, the CFO doesn't really care. Okay, um, the buyer doesn't really care. They want to translate anything, any value you provide into their own metrics that are typically reducing costs, reducing headcount, or increasing revenue. Okay, this is the thing. So one thing that you should do as an exercise is to understand how you can translate saving time into one of these two big families of metrics, reducing costs or, the, or growing revenue. For example, in reducing costs, here, in reducing costs here, you have, uh, um, you have less ad count, so less people will do that operation, or less external cost, less contractors or less use of external services. For example, if you have less account, the outcome for them, it you save fully loaded full-time employee costs. Okay, so uh, Jasper for with AI, they do this because you need less people to manage, uh, to manage knowledge base and, and writing content. Or if you lower the external costs, you displace vendor spend. This means that uh, the your customer will spend less with existing vendors because <coughs> they're using your solution. On the grow revenue side, you can talk about speed, get to market faster, which is a better way to say saving time. You can talk about quality, get to market better with less mistakes, with better UI, with better characteristics and consistency get to market predictably, okay? This means that uh, you remove all the friction, you remove uh, all the uncertainties from processes, like Calendly, for example. You remove the back and forth of emails to just get an appointment. So try to translate, uh, if, if your value is saving time, try to translate the saving time into, into metrics uh, that matter to the buyer. So you have to do some research and understand which of these metrics and more and the more are really important for them. Okay, <clears throat> now quickly show how it works, of course. So uh, do it from the user buyer's perspective. Don't explain how it works in the core, okay? That's not the moment to do it. You will have time later. But in a pitch deck, you have to show how easy it is for a user buyer to get to the value, 
show how much time it takes for a new user to receive the value, the first value at least, from your solution and do it ideally in three steps. So choose the key three steps for it with a demo or a storyboard that shows what is the engagement of the user in order to unlock the value, okay? For example, in the case of the battery is uh, uh, get a truck with a container close to the power plant, connect the power plant to the battery, and three is sell the energy to the uh, grid operator uh, when the sun uh, is uh, set, after, after sunset. Because a, a, a power plant operator in a, in a solar system, in a solar power plant has, has the problem that when the, uh, the, so, the sun is high and there is a lot of production with the solar panels, the kilowatt hour is as a very low price. But in the evening, the kilowatt hour, because the demand is high, and the supply is low, has a very high price. So if they could shift giving the energy in the evening, then they will get a lot of profit. And so with your battery, okay, delivered from with a truck as a container and easy to connect and then start using it the same day, then you show how it is easy, easy. Of course, uh, it's more complex than that, but your your task is to pick two, three, four steps that show how easy it is to unlock the first value, okay? This is really important. Then in later meetings, you can show other use cases and other things, the back office, the analytics, whatever it is, but always show that they get to the value. Another tip is that I see very often overcome, overlooked by founders is if you have a track record, if you have previous exits, if you have a recognized expertise in specific technology, or if you spent years in a specific domain and you know it uh, very well, share your story about that and show the team early in the deck. Okay, don't make the mistake to show the team in as, as one of the last slides. If the team is as something special, even one person of the team, if you, have a, if you are in the pharmaceutical world and you have a, one of the founders that spent 15 years at Bayer, okay, tell that. So it's very important, tell that early because remember you have a very short time to interest people. They will make an unconscious, unconscious decision in a very few seconds, if you are worth it or not of their attention. So anything, a story, uh, the, team, the team strengths, uh, how strong is the problem? These are three elements that will hook them up, okay? Because if you have a story in the domain, if you have a specific ability, or if you have exits in the past, they are not going to miss this, okay? They will pay attention. I can guarantee you, if you start your pitch with one of these elements, strong demand, strong pain, uh, your story, or a special value of the team, they will pay attention. A quick word on business model. <clears throat> so essentially, so I, I have a lot of questions about, I receive a lot of questions about the business model because it can be complex. Okay, but the question they really have in mind, it's not what's your business model, it's how do you make money? Okay, in the pitch, you have to tell them how you make money. Is it a recurring fee? Is it a one-off thing? Is it that you give them away the hardware and then you get paid for the service? So you have just to tell them what is your business model. There are 10, 12 business models standardized, okay? Pick one of them, and go on. It's very important that you really make a check in this because the business model is really complex matter and requires attention and time. This is not for the first pitch, okay? So in the business model, just show them what is your revenue model? What is your go-to-market, basic go-to-market? And if you want to know more, 
search for business model canvas because business model canvas will make you go through a process where you are going to cover all the elements of the business model and then pick the two or three elements that are really important to be to, to be told in the pitch deck okay you just have to tell them tell them show them that you know how you get money because if you don't show how you make money the entire pitch is useless okay you may have the solution for all the problems of the world but if you don't show them if you don't show them how you have an idea for monetizing it there is no business and so they will not invest so the real question is how you make money okay another thing another thing that i receive very often by hardware companies is oh investors think hardware is hard okay that's not true that's a legend hardware is hard is something said by uh, vcs that have no hardware in their investment thesis okay so the problem is not you the problem is that you shouldn't have been invited to pitch to them so, so this is because maybe they didn't do any any screening and so they didn't detect that you were not a fit for their investment thesis and so do your research and uh, talk to your scout to talk to your contact point look at the companies they have in the portfolio and if you have a hardware in your in your business model to, uh, go to talk go and talk to vcs that uh, have that in their investment thesis and at that point your your task becomes the risking the hardware part okay just to give you an idea if you have hardware in your business model show that you are de-risking the hardware part show that it works if it works uh, show that you know how to build it how to deliver it how to install it how to operate it how to support it and how to dispose of it show that your hardware contains a secret sauce you have intellectual property you have patents uh, show that the hardware is important for your business model for retention uh, and it's also a, a moat, a defense line against competition. Think about iPod, okay? iPod is a piece of hardware, but the magic was done by the iPod with iTunes service, okay? Um, and another objection that you may get is, uh, does it imply CapEx for customers? This means that the customers have to expend capital upfront to acquire your hardware. Is it okay for their CFO, for their model of acquiring things? Or maybe you can adopt an OPEX model, operational expenditure model, operating expenditure, means that you lease your hardware, you rent your hardware, or maybe you give the hardware as a service without a big need for your capital, for need for capital. Uh, show that you have proprietary technology. Uh, did you solve all the problems of these proprietary technologies? Or maybe you mix off the shelf components. So it means you're de risking things because the components are off the shelf. And so you, your secret sauce is how you uh, compose these, these sensors or these elements, these hardware elements, or the algorithms you add in your, your machine learning parts. Do you have industrial partners? How does hardware impact on the sales cycle? Does it make sales um, faster or slower? Uh, the fact that you provide the hardware, does it make faster because you can deliver hardware in a few days and the customer is, is already available? Or it makes it slower because you require hardware and the customer has to acquire hardware on their own channels. I've seen startups uh, get, having this problem where the customer has to acquire hardware from standard channels. And so the startup is not in control of that. And so the sales process slows down because Acquiring the hardware is a complex process, is procurement, uh, and so on and so forth. Instead, by providing you the hardware, it's a quick, quick time to value. And, and what's your need for capital? What's your pressure on cash flow and timing? So hardware is hard because of these elements, but it's not a showstopper for certain VCs. So do your research and pick the VCs that know how to ask these questions and deal with hardware. <clears throat> of course, investors like traction. It reduces risk. 
interaction speaks louder than words. If you show the numbers, you don't have to talk about it. With just one slide, you will have their attention. So what is traction? Traction ideally is proof that you have a small group of customers that are paying for your product, okay? As a second order can be users that are adopted your, use, your product and incorporated it into their routine. So if you cannot show revenue, at least show stickiness, show that you have a cohort of users that is nine months old or one year old, and they incorporated your product in their daily usage, weekly usage, okay? Or even they renewed, uh, they renewed their, 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 um, <clears throat> their usage. So it's a, it's a group of customers, real ones that are paying for your product. And once you have traction, this means that you can talk to these clients. And the best thing that can happen is that most of these early customers belong, have common attributes, common traits. They belong to a customer segment, to a market segment. This is a very good thing. Why? Because if you have a, 100 customers and they are all over the place they have nothing in common or you have 12 customers or 50 customers and they are all different the investor may think that they are random sales okay that you are not really addressing a concrete problem or you are not a good fit for a customer segment instead if you can describe your early group of customers in your traction with common attributes, you can say, look, we are onto something. It looks like the solution as it is today is already making value, generating value for customers with these attributes. This means that in your plan, in your go-to-market plan, you can say, in the next 12 months, we are going to consolidate in this market segment. We are going to fine tune our communication to talk to these specific types of customer. And so you show the ICP, the ideal customer profile, by describing the attributes, the context, the job to be done, the desired outcomes of this specific segment, okay? Don't show that you can sell to anybody. Don't show that you are all over the place, especially if you are in early stage, okay? Show that you know how to focus because you know who is your ideal customer, because you have a limited number of resources and you must show focus. So investors want to see that you know your market and you know how to focus to, um, to get to the next fund round, uh, funding round, okay? When you sell to investors to raise money now, you are actually selling the plan to get to the next financing round, to the next funding round. So for traction, show the numbers, okay? Show the numbers means how many customers, how, for how long they have been customers, uh, the proportion between uh, free and paying, um, and show the lifetime value, okay? If you have paying customers, uh, show the lifetime value. So um, if you have traction for enough time, you may guess, you may estimate uh, what is your gross margin from each sale and multiply by the number of months you retain the customer and that's the lifetime value. So for example, if you make uh, $1,000 a month from a customer and you are going to have a customer for three years, then you can say the lifetime value as an approximation is $36,000. And then divide by customer acquisition cost. The customer acquisition cost is calculated as the total cost of marketing and sales in a year, for example, or in a, in a quarter, in a period, 
divided by the deals, the new customers that you closed in that same period. So for example, if you're spending $1 million to close 10 deals, okay, your cost of acquisition is $100,000. If the lifetime value is 10 million, that's that you have your, 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 your ratio. So this is something that if you have traction from for, a, for, a, for enough time, the investors are going to ask. So if you show a, a slide of traction that shows that you have cohorts of customers for a certain time, they are going to ask that. So do you have enough data to calculate the lifetime value? Do you have, what was the cost of acquisition for those customers? And of course, they know that the cost of acquisition will go down over time once you apply all the operating and processes and the lifetime value may go up with more retention. But if you show traction, they will ask. Traction condensed in these two indicators, especially this ratio. This is very important, okay? Very, very important. Now that you have some traction numbers, now you can talk about the market size. So project your traction metrics into the real market potential, okay? Because this is way better than the top-down calculations made with segmentation. So the market size can be calculated in two ways, top-down. So you look at your target market and then you segment down until you find your addressable market or serviceable market or obtainable market, whatever is the, the criteria you want to use. But in general, investors, they don't care about the acronyms. They want to see how you segment. Okay, what's the starting point? You can also segment in a different direction. You can say, we are starting from uh, uh, Germany as a market, and then we are expanding to Europe, and then we are expanding to all the Western world, and then you are expanding to the world. So going up is, is okay. But it's important that you show logic, you show logical steps in your market segmentation and your calculation. Another approach, once you have traction numbers, is bottom-up reasoning. You have traction, you identify the common attributes. Now you can look at how many people like this are in, the, in this territory, in this geography, in this market. For example, if you're selling to teachers, uh, fifth grade teachers, then you can go into a database and say, how many fifth grade teachers are in the United States? And then you know the, the number. And now you have your market. And then you say, I want teachers that work uh, outside of big cities. And then you segment that market. So, okay, fifth grade teachers working not in a city, uh, in a rural environment, for example. And then you have the number. And then you say, this is my initial market. And then you start talking about those numbers. So um, bottom up means that you really count how many potential users, potential customers are based on the attributes that you identified during your market tests, your traction. And, and so you can combine the two. You can do top down and you can do bottom up and show that there is a consistency, for example, between the two calculations. And they will, will build more trust in you more credibility, you will have more credibility because you have been doing the market size calculation in both directions. So it's again about credibility. Again, I repeat, describe details of target segments and your ideal customer profile to build your credibility. If you have traction, you must do that. You can say, I have 10 clients and, I, and my revenue is $100,000. That's not enough. You have to say, okay, but what do you know about this market? Okay. So how do you approach growth? They will ask you, how will the market learn that you exist? And you have to have an answer for that. How they will understand the value. And you can say there is a try and buy, or we have a prototype we can send and we can do pro for concept. We have a process. Uh, for pre we have pre-sales engineering to show them. Uh, we have uh, a free tool to 
uh, explore their knowledge base and tell them whatever. So sh the investor will ask you how a prospect will understand that there is value, okay? The, the trial, the free trial is a good answer, but there are cases where it's not applicable. And how they decide to use you and buy you, okay? They will have this kind of questions about growth. Of course, word of mouth is always the best answer, okay? <laughs> because this means that uh, happy users are telling other people that they should try you. Okay, let's talk uh, about demand side again. Now, instead of talking about the forces, which is a static view, let's talk about timeline. What is the customer's timeline? So how, do, how does a customer become a customer? A customer? Um, you remember they are using their current solution and they may have some problem, okay? So in order to notice whatever communication you're doing, whatever messaging, whatever advertising you are doing, you need for them to have space in their mind to notice your message, your advertising, your blog post, whatever, your brochure. When they are at the trade show, they notice your booth and they stop your booth so what is a way to create a first thought in their mind you may ask a question you may tell a story where someone similar to them had a similar problem and solved it with your solution give them a new metric to assess their situation and state the obvious for example a new metric is okay you are happy with your batteries but do you know uh, how recyclable are they are or okay you are buying these solar panels but do you know what's the carbon footprint uh, of making the solar panels so you give them a new metric to evaluate their existing solution to make space for the next phase passive looking passive looking means this person now has space in their mind and is not looking actively for, an, for replacing the solution, but now is sensitive. And when they see an article, when they see a booth in a trade show, when they see something about that topic, they will pay attention, they will notice. And so how you feed this passive looking face by sharing your views of the problem, not introducing, not trying to sell your solution yet. It's too early to sell, okay? They are not ready to buy but you can share your views of the problem, share success cases, share articles about that, share content about the problem, okay? About the new metric or about reiterating the story or uh, uh, asking that question over and over again without providing the answer. Then there will be something that will happen where these people will go into active looking and they will start seeing possibilities. They will start seeing that there is a multiple offering for that problem. And that's the moment to show the benefits and how you compare to other options, to give them a way to compare that is good for your comparison. After this phase, if you apply pressure to a person that is active, actively looking, then we, you will force them to make trade-offs and buy something. Okay, what is a trade-off? A trade-off means that once you know the dimensions to compare, once you know your needs and what's important for you, then you're gonna trade off one attribute of the solution for one of your needs. For example, if I, if my, if I have a car, my car is old and I go to the, to the, um, to the car dealer and I want that car, okay? And I want a car that is red, for example. Um, and, uh, and, 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 the seller, and the seller says, look, we have the car you want, but it's blue. Now we can do two things. You can uh, wait three months and have this car in red, or you can buy this. I give you a discount and the discount is valid only for this weekend. Now you have a, you have a trade off to do. So if you need the car now, you may settle and get the blue one. But if you can wait and you really want to have it red, then you wait three months and, 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 and get the car red. 
the context will really drive this. If your existing car is broken, very likely you will take the offer and get the blue car. But if your car is still good and uh, your family doesn't have any specific problem, any, any big trip in, in sight or other things, maybe you can wait three months. And so you can see that the salesperson is also adding another element, which is the discount to see if in your trade-off, the price is relevant, okay? So at that point, by putting, by creating a time pressure on the pricing, he is trying another dimension, which is price. And so the decision-making moment is very important. This is the moment where you try to sell, okay? Selling in the green phase will make you look bad, but the red one is where you put all the pressures to try to sell discounts, uh, time walls, and other things. Then it's not ended. You need to, st to stay on top of the things and make sure that in the first use, the user is making progress and get to some initial value very quickly, okay, with low friction, and make sure to celebrate that value. So make sure that they notice that that value came thanks to you, to your product. In this way, they validate and they say, oh, I took a risk in getting this new solution, but it was a good idea because I get already the value. And they can even tell to a boss, to a manager, to a spouse and say, look, see, this new thing is a good one. And then the final thing that you are, have to stay on top of it is build habits. Make sure they build habits with ongoing use understand the triggers to use your product, encourage investment, time to put data, to use it in some way, to, to upload files and so on. Why this? Because you are becoming the new status quo. You are becoming the box on the left of the four forces. You are now the status quo. You are now the, the current behavior, the, the business as usual, and you have to protect it. And so now your problem becomes that the push force has to stay small because you want to keep the customers happy. So this is the time version of the same, uh, of the same demand side mentality, but illustrating how the customers goes through the, to the time. So one of the last topics I want to cover is how you talk about competition, okay? Talking about competition is very critical for your credibility. If you say you have no competitors, you will get negative points. Okay, because competition is not just other companies competing with you. Competition means other solutions, okay? You don't exist yet. And the investor will say, well, you have no competition, but you, if you don't exist, how these people solve their problem, okay? And you have to talk about that. For example, Netflix, okay, the, the, the content, entertainment content platform, they say they were saying that their competitors were sleep, video games, even making sex, you know, having sex is, is a competitor, because they were competing with uh, watching TV. Uh, even cooking is a competitor for Netflix because you spend time in the kitchen. And so um, you have to think broader. And when you talk about competition, talk about the status quo. Even doing nothing is a competitor, okay? And so it's very important that you uh, show competition. That's why the best pitch decks I've seen and the best pitches I've seen, uh, most successful ones, they illustrate, comp they introduce competition in three steps. And I recommend you do the same. The first step is demand side. Show the top priorities for your target market. What are the desired outcomes? What are the metrics? How they measure it's good for me? Okay, in this way, without talking about your solution, you again build credibility in the fact that you know your market. So the first step for competition is show the priorities from the demand side. The second step is still don't talk about you, but show the how the alternatives fulfill the desired outcomes you introduce in step one. Okay, this is important. These are the important things. And this is how the existing solutions cater to these needs, okay? 
and then highlight the gap left by the underserved needs. And step three, position your solution in the gap. This is one of the best ways I've seen to guide the investors into understanding why you are desirable, okay? If you show a competition slide that shows that you are the best, they will remain cold because they expect that you are the best, of course. But instead of building that with them in three steps, it takes the same time, but brings you on your side, okay? Because you kept the demand side perspective. Let's see two examples that you may know very well. The first one is the classic two by two that is good for crowded markets. You first, you show the two important, the most important uh, metrics or outcomes that the market wants, that segment wants. Then you position the existing solutions, the status quo. You can also position do nothing. You can also position the incumbent. Uh, you can also position the best seller, whatever it is, the most adopted solution. And you can also position entrance if you want to highlight uh, that in this market, there is already some other innovator, okay? It depends on the message you want to do, you want to, to convey, okay? Incumbent, do nothing, and other innovators like you. And then highlight the, the gap and show that you are actually uh, crafting a solution that is best <clears throat> for them. Another opportunity is when you have multiple dimensions, more than two, a thing that I've seen works very, very well, is understood very well by investors is, uh, again, show, step one, show what is, what's important, energy density, safety, recyclability, carbon footprint, and then show the performance of your competitors, of a better, existing solutions is a better definition than competitors, existing solutions. So ABC, how they cover the four dimensions, and then show that you are beating all of them. So if you get to these prospects and show this comparison, they will evaluate you in this way. Okay, this is the, the meaning of, the, of talking about competition. Another tip, what if you have no product yet? If you don't have a product, so you, don't, you cannot compare, at least show that there is a founder market fit. Again, it's the same story. Show that you and your team are very well positioned to create a roadmap and to satisfy the market that you know the dimensions that the market will use to evaluate your solution and compare to the existing ones. So show that there is a founder market fit. You can do it starting with the founder origin story. What brought you to this venture? What, con con what convinced you to start to put your time and energy on this? And uh, you have really very few seconds to interest people. Uh, they will politely listen to you for the four minutes or 10 minutes that you have, but you have to interest them in the first 10, 20, 30 seconds, no more than that. And last word, uh, many pitch decks are full of text. Okay, that's bad, very bad. People will start reading on the, on the slide and they will not listen to you. If you want to put, so in the slides, you have to put graph charts, uh, images, uh, numbers with labels, uh, but don't put text. Don't put more than a few words. So if you want to put, text okay uh, in the listen to me deck <clears throat> prepare takeaway phrases what do you want them to say to someone else about you okay on each slide just write what's the message in the form of something that you would like them to write on their notebook okay when they take notes or want them to repeat to someone else about you okay it's like really uh, putting the takeaway in their mind, okay? So don't put long text in the listen to me version, but put, keep it simple for the brain and just put some notes. Why this? Because you 
need two slide decks. One is the listen to me deck that you use when you present in person or in a video call, when you talk. And the other one is a read me deck that you send for self-consumption. You start with the read me deck, you focus on the, on, the, on the logic, on the sequence, and then edit out, remove all the text, simplify the slides, maybe keep the same sequence, but don't put text on screen. Okay, only this is very important. Um, what about this? Yes. And then another tip is the slide that stays out the most on the most is the opening slide. In a, in a demo day, very likely, the opening slide will stay longer while uh, there is a change on the stage, uh, the microphone, uh, is, is, is given to you. So the opening slide is very important. So on the opening slide, put your logo, the name of your company, if the logo is not very clear, put the name of your company. Sometimes logos are very hard to decode. So put the name in text and your one liner, what you do, okay? Look at the, um, look at other slide decks and take inspiration on what to put in your one-liner, okay? So, and then end with the last slide. The last slide should be always the ask, okay? So the pitch is never 100% effective, it's natural. Every audience has a different background and attention level. Investors are very good at asking the questions about the gaps of your pitch. And so, even if you, you, you know that your pitch is not perfect, they will ask you the questions that will tell you what are the gaps. So take the opportunity. Don't use all the time for your pitch, okay? Keep your pitch no more than 10 minutes. This is very important. Save most of the time for Q&A. If you have to sacrifice a slide, put it in the backup and use it during the Q&A. But don't saturate all your time with your pitch. Use one third, if you have 30 minutes, 10 minutes of pitching and 20 minutes of Q&A. This is very, very important. Maybe this is the, one of the most important tips I, I got and I learned on the field. Q&A is the most precious time. The most precious time is not when you talk, is when you get questions. For the ask, we are, we are almost over. For the ask slide, this is what I see very often. We are seeking $2 million and this is how we're gonna spend it. We can do better than this. This is not good, okay? This will raise a lot of standard questions that will make you waste your time. You have to show that you have a plan for their money. So what is the content for an ask slide? Investors want to see that you are seeking a specific amount of money and want to see what are the goals you want to achieve in this time frame with that money in terms of team goals hiring people product milestones build this deliver this feature deliver this module whatever is in the product deliver this version of the hardware and achieve market results i with this money we are going to bring in x customers in 12 months okay x customers in the next three months x customers in the next six months this is very important be bold and show that you have goals for the money, not spending plans, okay? So show your steps. Okay, you have 12, 18 months with this money, hire X, release X, launch, have X paying customers and so on. So some tips about this. If you, if you, if you don't plan to raise this, the whole money with the one single VCs, you very likely, uh, you may want to show a tight range. For example, if you aim to raise uh, $2 million and you know that you are not gonna get that money from a single VC, just say 1.5 to $2 million. In this way, if you raise uh, 1.6 million, you are still successful, okay? Because maybe the first one gave you 1 million and then you raise 600,000 from other VCs or other investors. And so uh, make it a range. Okay, 1.7 to 2 million or 1.1 million to 1.2. So make it a range. 
In this way, you also show that your plan is resilient and works with different amounts of money. Maybe you have one or two, three head counts in a difference. Uh, don't put the valuation on the slide deck ever, ever, okay? The valuation is something to be discussed in another meeting and they have patterns. So don't put the valuation in your deck ever. Uh, if you have previous funding, tell them. If you have notable investors, tell them. And show the use of funds in the next 12, 18 months. So goals and a basic breakdown of, of, of funds. So uh, high level view taken from your financial projections. And then how you prepare for the next round. You see this, this money here. So on the left, you have uh, what you are raising now. On the right is what you will raise toward the end of this plan. They want to see how you prepare for the next round. So you want to tell them that you will go to the next round with these results. You will go with a better team, you will go with a better pro with a product, and you will go with traction, okay, with growth. And so it's very important and in this slide that you convey the message of how you get ready for the next financing round. This is extremely important. And this should be the last slide that stays on top. So it is the blueprint to discuss the plan that you want to do, that you want to execute on. Okay, now open up a spreadsheet, not PowerPoint, okay, and do this. Create three columns, a title, a message, and information, and create your pitch outline. Your pitch outline is essentially your storytelling broken down into slides, into steps. For example, your, your origin story, if you want to start with the origin story, then the problem, the solution benefits, the traction you have, the business model, the competition, the team, and the ask for fundraising. This is a typical story. You may, your, your deck will vary, different order. You may have more slides, uh, but do it with your co-founders and work in text first. Write the single message you want to convey in a single slide. And then on the right, write the information about the content that should be in the slide or should be said you can have four columns, one for the slide content, one for the talk uh, or, or derive it from for, for the read me version versus the listen to me version, but do it in text and go over and over this 100 times until the storytelling is super strong and then work on the visuals because the visuals are time consuming and it's more important that you iterate on this, okay? And the last final check, the last minute we have is a checklist I want to share with you. Once you have your pitch and you have the pitch already, ask these questions, do it in a group and see where you cover the answer to these questions. These are the standard questions that you must cover with your pitch. Don't waste your Q&A time by having them asking you any of these questions, okay? You cover this and then in Q&A, you will have uh, special questions that will give you a lot of information about what is uh, going on in their head and what, and that they are engaged to know more, okay? So this is very important. This is the checklist. Uh, you will have it in the, in the PDF that they will share with you and, uh, and ask your question, do it in a group so that you cannot cheat but you must answer and grade yourself in the first thing. Grade yourself. This is missing X or this is good, green, or this can be improved, up, up arrow. So missing, improving, uh, must be improved and check. And I thank you for your time, your patience, two hours listening to my rambling. Uh, you can send me messages to my email address. Uh, thank you to the team, the Entopan team, the Innovit team for, for inviting me for this. And, and thank you again for, for listening.